All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst uh, here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, uh, where people can join in and ask their questions all around web search. Um, there are a bunch of questions that were submitted already. Not, not a ton, but, but a few. Um, but if any of you want to get started with a question of your own, you're welcome to jump in. Right away. I could actually start off if that's OK. Perfect. Yeah, uh, I have a question regarding uh, some, some weird Googlebot activity that I um, seem to not be the only one who's experienced this. Sort of late March, um, some of our sites got, I got 20, 20 to 30 times more at bot activity. Uh, to, to almost to the extent we had to go in and sort of limit uh, limit Googlebot for a while because it was hammering our servers so hard. Any any input on what was going on? If it's something that shouldn't have happened, or I don't know. Uh, so I so someone else mentioned this. I think uh, with regards to early April, so kind of same period, I guess. Um, I, I took a quick look at, at their setup and uh, the, the general bigger picture view. And overall, it's not that Googlebot is crawling a lot more. Uh, so I think what, what is happening is just on some sites, we happen to find a lot of URLs and we started crawling those more. And uh, on other sites, we're just crawling normally. So as, as far as I know, I don't think anything really changed in, in the setup that, that we use there. Uh, so in, in the case of the other sites that, that I looked into a little bit more, um, what was happening there is that for some reason, we were running into some, I think, some forms on, on the site which we were submitting, which, which Googlebot sometimes does. And that ended up creating a gigantic mess of URL parameters. Uh, and so we found, I don't know, millions of new URLs. And we thought, well, maybe we should check these URLs out and uh, crawl them to see what comes up. And that led to us kind of crawling a ton of URLs. Because from, from our point of view, it seemed that the server was able to handle the load. So we just decided to, to crawl a lot more there. Um, usually, yeah, we, we that, didn't that... have any prob problems that it couldn't handle it. but you know yeah. the you know, basically, it's an automated setup where more servers are added into the cluster on need. So all of a sudden, the price went up uh, terribly. Because my suspicion was that uh, you started uh, started following the nofollow links. Because um, it's an e-commerce site with tons of filters that have been nofollow forever. And uh, maybe you started uh, following those and finding a lot of new interesting parameter URLs that way. I, I don't think that would be that visible. So. It feels like from from purely from the nofollow point of view, I don't think that would be happening. Uh, from the URLs that were being crawled, would those match the ones uh, that you you tend to link like that, or um, was that hard to yeah. check in the logs? Yeah, I actually don't have access to the logs, unfortunately, so I can't say for Good sure. Day. OK. If, if you can send me uh, a link to your site, I, I'm happy to take a look afterwards and see if there's something weird happening with, with those parameter URLs or if this is just Googlebot being super curious. All right. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, tell me. Tell me. I'm listening to you. All right. N any other questions before we get started? Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Sounds like someone's other phone somewhere else. Um, OK. Um, otherwise, I'll just jump in through some of the questions that were submitted. And uh, you're all welcome to kind of jump in in between if there's something you want to add or if you have a related question that you'd like to go through. Um, let's see. Recently, in January, Google released product features in the US search results and also opened up the merchant account for unpaid users as well. Is there any advantage uh, for non-US businesses that SEOs can take advantage of? Um, so I don't know all of the details around uh, the, the product shopping side. Uh, 
Um, my understanding is that the Merchant Center is something that you can use regardless of whether you're using kind of the, the paid, uh, paid part of uh, product search or not. So that might be something to, to check out. Um, I, I don't know what the future plans are in, in this regard. Usually what happens uh, when we launch something in the US first, it's more to kind of get a feel for how things are working. And then over time, we end up expanding that to, to other regions, other countries, other languages. Uh, I don't know if, particularly with product search, there might be legal or policy reasons involved that make this a little bit trickier or not. Uh, with some search features, that's the case. With other search features, it's more a, a practical nature that we kind of need to test in a small scale first before we open things up for everyone. Uh, so from just purely from, from my point of view, with regards to search features like this that are currently US only or English only, uh, my recommendation would be to, to take a look at them and think about how they might make sense for your site, even if you're not in the US. And if you can implement something that takes advantage of features like that, then you'll be ready when, when things open up a little bit more. Um, I don't think we, we can ever really promise ahead of time when we open up which features in which regions or which languages. Um, but in general, our plan is to take features and have them as broadly used as possible. Um, I was wondering if there's any best practice for URL structure of AMP pages. If you use a subdomain or a folder in upper level, you can have better possibility for analyzing on different tools. Uh, but I was wondering if there's any benefit for Google if you put your AMP pages under the root domain instead of a subdomain or parameters. Uh, so. From, from Google's point of view, I, I think the only criteria that is critical for AMP pages is that it has to be on the same domain. So if you have it in a subdomain or a subdirectory, all of that is perfectly fine. Uh, in general, with these kind of related pages, uh, I would recommend doing them in a way that works best for you, uh, so something where um, it's easy for you to track. It's easy for you to monitor. It's easy for you to maintain that setup. Uh, so if it works well for your CMS, for example, if it works well for your server setup, then that's that's a good choice. I wouldn't worry about uh, kind of like is there any kind of Google tweak uh, that makes a big difference with regards to these alternate URLs. The the other thing I would watch out for with these alternate URLs is that you don't change the patterns too often. Uh, so ideally, if you pick something like a subdirectory or a subdomain, then try to keep that for as long as you can. It's not quite the same as if you change your primary URLs with regards to search. Uh, but anytime you change URLs in general, then we, we kind of have to reprocess that. And if you're changing the alternate URLs that are associated with every page on your site, then that means we have to reprocess a lot of URLs to kind of understand that new setup. Uh, so pick subdomain or subdirectory or parameters if you want, whatever works best for you, and uh, try to keep that setup uh, ideally for the long run. Uh, I run a site about smartphone photography. Occasionally, like uh, once every three months, I write a guest post on another topically related sites. Uh, these guest posts are about topics that I don't cover on my own website. And these guest posts contain a link to my website in the end. At the bottom of the home page of my website, I have a section named In the Media, where I link back to these guest posts. Uh, currently, these are follow links. Uh, does this harm my SEO? <clears throat> what, what's the best practice for linking back to guest posts in order to not harm SEO? Uh, so in general, with guest posts, you're placing the link essentially on another site. Uh, so in general, that would be considered an un unnatural link. So I would recommend using nofollow for that. So if you're using a guest post, you're linking back to your site, then use nofollow links for that. Um, I think at the scale where you're doing this at the moment, where it's like, I don't know, once every couple of months, I, I don't think anyone from the web spam team would 
would look at that and say, oh, this, this site is maliciously abusing these guest post links and trying to artificially increase their site's ranking. So I don't think that's something you urgently need to worry about. Uh, but in general, for guest posts, you should use nofollow links. With regards to linking back to that site uh, to kind of like highlight where your content has been shown, you can do that however you want. Uh, so you can use nofollow links if you want, but I think a normal followed link is also perfectly fine for that. Uh, since you're essentially showing kind of where, where all of your content is being published, and that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, with regards to SEO, I think at the scale where you're doing it, you probably wouldn't see any advantage or disadvantage. Uh, with regards to kind of building a bigger audience for your website, that might be a good thing to kind of talk about related topics on other websites and maybe interest some users into visiting your site as well. So th that's, from, from my point of view, that sounds kind of good. Uh, but purely from an SEO point of view, I don't think you're doing kind of a lot in positive or negative direction there. Uh, we're running an online shop. Does it make sense to have long descriptions uh, on the product pages, or is it a problem to have similar content on the product pages? Uh, we're selling products in different thicknesses for these, and we're using the canonical tag. Uh, we also have products with similar characteristics. Uh, should we focus on category pages for longer information about our products? Um, ultimately, that's kind of up to you. So you can. So I think the the general approach that you're using here is that you have a canonical to a preferred version of your product, and I think that's a good idea uh, because that makes that preferred version a little bit more visible for your site overall, and. That's usually a good thing, because then we, when we look at your site, we understand which are kind of the primary pages to focus on. We can highlight these a little bit better in search. They can rank a little bit better. That's, that's all good stuff. Uh, with regards to the descriptions, uh, if the alternate versions of those products have the same or very similar description and a canonical link back to the primary version of the product, then that doesn't matter at all, because we will try to focus our indexing on the primary version of the product. So if you have an item that's available in different colors or different thicknesses, different sizes, and essentially it's all the same product, it just has different URLs, and you have a canonical to a preferred version there, we'll focus our indexing on that preferred version. And essentially, what you have on these alternate versions is, is less critical for us. Uh, in many cases, we won't even index that content at all. Uh, so it doesn't matter for us if that's duplicate or not. Even if we were to index those alternate versions of a product and they had a similar description or the same description, uh, that wouldn't be a problem uh, from our side of things. So in particular, it wouldn't be seen as spam uh, because this is just like the same product. It's just different URLs, different variations. Uh, it wouldn't be seen as low quality content. Uh, it would just be seen as, as duplicate descriptions. We would understand the pages are different. But some of the content on those pages are the same. And when someone searches for something generic uh, that's in that kind of shared piece of content, uh, then we'll try to find the best matching page within your website. Uh, that's essentially not, not something negative for your website. It just means like we have all of these pages indexed. We know there's a lot of duplication across these pages. And we'll try to show the right one in the search results. Um, in, in general, as a best practice, I think the setup that you have is great. Uh, so picking a canonical and saying, this is the version of the product that I really want to have indexed, that's kind of the, the uh, optimal solution, because then we, we can focus on that primary version of the product. And with regards to amount of text and descriptions you have on these pages, that's totally up to you. Uh, I would make sure that you have things there that make it easy for users to find your content. So in particular, uh, if you notice your users are using technical terminology to search for your products, then make sure you use those technical words. Uh, if they're using less technical um, 
terminology to search, then make sure you're covering that as well. So kind of make sure that your content matches what your users are looking for. And then it doesn't really matter how, how long or how short that content is. Um, can replacing redirecting internal links um, by the final URL improve anything? What are the cons if we have a lot of hrefs on our site uh, which are not the final URL? Uh, so our general recommendation is to link to the destination URL. Uh, that's, on the one hand, a matter of, of speed for users. On the other hand, a little bit of an optimization on our side for uh, ease of crawling and picking the right URL for indexing. Uh, so for users, obviously, if you click on a link and it has to redirect, then that's kind of an extra server trip that has to take place. And it slows things down a little bit. And often, it's something that's easy to fix. So from a user point of view, I would try to fix that. Uh, from a crawling point of view, we also have that redirect. Uh, if it's just one redirect when following a link, then that's less of an issue. We, we have a lot of time. We, we just try the next URL that's uh, kind of in that redirect chain and uh, try that one. Uh, if it's a matter of a chain set of redirects, like you linking to one page and then it goes five, six, seven hops until it finally reaches the destination page, then at some point, Google will pause crawling and follow the next steps in the redirect chain maybe the day, a day later. Uh, so multiple steps I would definitely try to avoid. A single step is less critical there for crawling. Uh, for indexing, what can happen here is that we might get confused which URL you want to have indexed. It doesn't change anything for ranking, but it's more a matter of which of these URLs that you have on your website is the right one to show. Uh, so for example, if you're linking to one version of the URL and uh, that, that URL redirects to a different URL, then we, we kind of have two URLs that lead to the same content. And then our systems have to make a decision and say, should I take the one that the website is pointing at and saying, like, this is the one that they want to have indexed? Or should I take the one uh, that's kind of destination of the redirect chain and index that one? Uh, from a ranking point of view, it doesn't change anything. It's really just the URL that's shown in search. And uh, there, that's essentially also up to you. If you don't care which URL is shown in search, then that's all fine. Uh, if you do care which one is shown in search, then I would make sure that everything is as clear as possible that this is really the one that you want to have shown. Um, I launched a new website recently and got 5 to 10 impressions. Uh, however, no query data has been shown yet. I see the number on the graph, the pages, the countries, but no queries. Is this normal? Are queries blocked by the privacy protection policy? Um, my guess is that it's just not enough queries yet. Uh, so we, we do filter queries that are below a certain threshold. And uh, I don't think that threshold is, is exactly defined. It might depend on, on various factors. Uh, it's also mentioned in the Help Center. Um, and if you're talking about 5 to 10 impressions for a website, then probably that's still below that, that amount. I'm pretty sure that over time, as the number of impressions for your website grows, then you'll start to see more of that out there. Uh, so it's also something where once we kind of have a better picture of the, the website and understand how it fits in with regards to the bigger picture of the web, then we can show it appropriately in the search results. So sometimes it takes a bit of time uh, to, to kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, what I would generally recommend, though, is not just to take this as something like, oh, I'll just wait a couple of months, and then it'll be better, uh, but take this as a kind of a situation where it's similar to when you're opening a business in, in a new location, where you need to do something to get the ball rolling yourself. Uh, so instead of just waiting for people to randomly search for your website and go to your website, Maybe there's a way that you can promote your website amongst people who, who are interested in this topic already. Um, maybe it's a matter of doing some ads. Maybe it's a matter of doing some outreach to, to related sites that might be able to point at your site as well. Um, essentially, like, 
like a normal business would do, you need to kind of get the ball rolling. You shouldn't just wait for people to come to your website and say, oh, look, I found this new website. Uh, so that's kind of my, my recommendation there. I think with a small number of impressions, it's a good start. Uh, but if you just wait for things to grow, then it's going to take a while for all of that to pick up. Um, does a title in Ahref contribute anything to SEO? Uh, so I, I took a quick look at some of the things around the title attribute uh, for uh, links. And uh, accessibility is a really big thing here. Uh, however, I am not an expert on accessibility. So my recommendation there would be to check uh, with someone from who has more of a background in accessibility to get their input on this. Uh, from an SEO point of view, I don't think it's something that's that's like super critical. Uh, we pick up information about links from the anchor text, from the context of the link. Uh, so we get a lot of information there already. It's not that you also need to just stuff keywords into title attributes. So my recommendation would be instead of trying to see this ultimately accessibility feature as an SEO element that you can just fill with content, uh, try to find ways to use accessibility features in the way that they're meant to be used. And for that, I'd recommend just checking in with uh, the accessibility experts instead. Uh, in the first phase, we're planning to add a last mod part of our to part of our sitemap, uh, basically URLs which are newly added or marked as indexed again after temporary no index. How will Google treat the remaining 80% of the sitemap URLs which have no last mod ta tag? Uh, can it cause any negative effect? Uh, later, we'll implement the last mod on all URLs, but it might take some time. We have over 2 million URLs on our sitemap. Uh, so the, the last mod date is the last modification date. You can add that to URLs in a sitemap file. Uh, it tells us that this is the date and the time when you last modified a page, which in turn gives us a little bit of a hint and says, well, maybe we should check this page out if we haven't seen it since it was last modified. It doesn't force us to go crawl those pages, but it does help us to figure out which ones we should prioritize as, a, as kind of a next step. Uh, so in general, if you're using a sitemap file, I'd strongly recommend using the last modification date. Uh, if you have the last modification date for part of your URLs and not all of them, that's perfectly fine, too. Uh, we, we store essentially the sitemaps data on a per URL basis. Uh, so it doesn't matter if some URLs have extra metadata and some URLs don't. Um, an example here would also be if you have images that you have uh, in the sitemap file for some URLs and you don't have them in others, or videos, and you include them in the sitemap file independently. Uh, all of those are variations that you can do. It doesn't make the other URLs in your sitemap file look, look worse. Um, it does help us to figure out which ones to crawl a little bit faster. So essentially, that's a good thing. Uh, is it correct that the site will not appear in Search Console linking site section if the site redirects to the 404 page on our own site? Uh, so I think I think it's just linking to the 404 page. So some external site is linking to a URL that returns 404. Uh, will we see linking sites in Search Console linking sites report? I suspect we won't, but the verification will be great. Um, so my understanding is we would drop these links completely, and uh, if we drop them completely, then they would not be listed in Search Console. Uh, so from, from that point of view, from just purely theoretical uh, situation like this, we, we would not be listing that in, in Search Console if an external site is linking to a page that is 404 on our own website. Um, the, the thing where this sometimes is, could be visible is if, if a page goes 404. If it wasn't 404 before, but now it's 404, then it takes a bit of time for all of, kind of the, the linking systems 
that track the data in Search Console to update the data there. So it's, it's certainly possible that you see links in Search Console that lead to pages which are currently 404. Over time, those will drop out of the report. Uh, but at least uh, in, in kind of the immediate uh, term, it's very possible that they'll continue to be listed there until they've been reprocessed, until Search Console is able to figure out, oh, it's time to remove these and to move on. Um, since this kind of, I, I think, situation where someone is linking to your website and then accidentally or for whatever reason you happen to remove a URL on your website uh, happens from time to time, um, I don't know if Search Console would be that useful to kind of track this and to highlight it to you. It's possible that external tools that kind of keep track of the links on the web would, would be better suited for that. Uh, but it feels like almost a feature request uh, that I should be passing on to the Search Console team uh, to see if we can't uh, create a report of people linking to pages that are now 404 on your website where you might be able to either restore those pages or maybe redirect them to a current version of a page instead so that those con links continue to work. I think for most websites, in the bigger picture, it doesn't really change that much. Um, but I realize sometimes people like to optimize for small things as well. Um, recently, I set up one WordPress uh, fully AMP base URL uh, early while testing the site with a demo account um, with Discourage search engines from indexing the site. Uh, that time, Google crawled the URL, and now it's showing as currently not indexed and software for error. Uh, it's also a 100% AMP-based website, and the 90-page index but enhancements uh, check AMP page is only one. OK, I think these are multiple questions. So let me try to split them out. Um, I, I think the, the general, like, like the starting point, is you have a test site uh, where you have some URLs that were marked as no index, and Google crawled them and found them to be no index, and flags them as currently not indexed, and they're soft 404. Uh, in, in theory, that's, that's the way it should be working. Uh, if we find a URL that's no index and we try to index the page but we realize we can't, then we will flag that to you in Search Console or we'll try to do that as much as we can. Uh, if you change that URL to be indexable, then the next time we reprocess that page and see the new content or able to re-index that page, we'll pick that up, and we'll be able to index it again. Uh, so generally speaking, there's nothing you need to do here. Uh, if these are individual pages, you could use the inspect URL and then submit to indexing tool to get those back into the system a little bit faster. Uh, but uh, in general, for any kind of reasonably sized website, that's not something that you'd need to do. Uh, once we see that the noindex is gone, we'll just reprocess that. Uh, with regards to the kind of AMP site, and in the AMP report, you're only seeing a smaller number of URLs than you have actually indexed, uh, that's also normal. Um, the the aggregate reports in Search Console, which includes the, the AMP report, they're based on a sample of the URLs from your website. Uh, so in index coverage, we'll try to show it as comprehensively as possible. Um, but the structured data reports and the AMP reports, uh, mobile friendliness and speed reports, I think these are all based on a sample of your website, so not the full set of URLs. Uh, so Usually, the, the way you would work with this is to use the index coverage to track what is actually indexed and to use these aggregate reports as a way of recognizing if there are any general problems that you need to resolve. And if you're looking at the aggregate reports and they're saying everything is great and 10 out of your 100 URLs uh, are were tested and they're all OK, then usually you can assume that the rest of your URLs are probably in a similar state and also OK. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to the aggregate report and see half of your pages are bad, 
then that's a sign that maybe a lot of your pages are bad. Or similarly, if you go there and you see a trend in kind of like more pages are being bad or fewer pages are, are bad, then that's also a sign that either something broke, maybe, or something got fixed. Um, let's see. Next question there is for the AMP cache. I use the AMP URL API, but didn't give any effect in Search Console. Uh, does that process take time? Uh, so the AMP cache is something that happens automatically. Uh, in, in particular, with AMP pages, um, they can be cached because of the way that they're set up, and they can be served from uh, from the search results directly. And that's something that happens automatically when someone searches for a page, and we see that it's an AMP page, and it's a valid AMP page, and uh, we can pre-cache it, then we will pre-cache it. Uh, there's no need to use the AMP uh, your API uh, for that. The AMP API is probably more for situations where you have a really large website and you need to refresh a lot of URLs in the AMP cache, then that's, that's kind of a useful use of the AMP, um, AMP cache or AMP. I don't know what it was called, the AMP API. Uh, but if you're talking about a small website and you're being shown in search in a reasonable way, then there's no need to use the AMP API at all. Uh, years ago, you suggested infinite scrolling with pagination. And in previous Hangouts, you told us that Google creates a large viewport when a page has infinite scrolling. So my question is, if we have infinite scrolling with pagination and mark our paginated pages as no index, how will Google read or index this? Uh, will Google index page one on the basis of page one content only? Or will it also consider products which come into the giant viewport or will Google not create a giant viewport for such pages once it understands that these paginated pages are generally no indexed? Uh, wow, this is kind of a complicated setup. I think, uh, in, in general, what I would watch out for is that you're not accidentally no indexing something that you want to have indexed. Uh, so in particular, with kind of this uh, infinite scrolling setup, we would try to render the page in a large viewport. And with the large viewport, we will do that expansion once. We will try to get the content that is shown for that large viewport. And we'll render that page and use that for indexing. So if, by using a large viewport, your page adds by JavaScript a noindex tag to that page, then we would consider that whole page to be noindex. It's not that we would say, well, initially it didn't have a no index, and now it does. So we'll take the initial content and index that. It's if, after rendering, your page has a no index on it, we will drop that page from our index. Uh, so that's kind of the, the tricky part to watch out for. Uh, on the other hand, if by clicking on a link and kind of following a new URL, that new URL has no index, then just that new URL will be dropped from index. But uh, if, if through rendering a page, you add a no index to a page, uh, then that's, that's a no index on the page, regardless of how that came there. Can, can uh, I chime in with a follow up on that? Sure. So, so, what you're saying is that basically that if I have an infinite scroll page, let's assume it's a category page on an on a e commerce website, uh, maybe I show 20 products, and then when you scroll at the bottom of that, I load another 20, and then that continues until they're all shown. Are you saying that Googlebot, when crawling or trying to index this, will do that once, will basically scroll down once and say, oh, something more loaded, load that, and then, but not twice? Yeah, yeah. So we, I don't think we trigger on scrolling, but rather we try to load it in a large viewport. So in, in Chrome, what you can do is with the, uh, what is it? The, it? What's it called? The, the inspect feature, you can uh, specify a, a different viewport. So you could specify something like 9,000 pixels high viewport and load the page like that. And essentially, what, what is loaded for a viewport like that would be what we would try to index. I don't know what the exact size is. I think the size also probably changes over time. Uh, but essentially, it's a long viewport. And if 
your page is set up in a way that it loads kind of the next piece of content uh, once, then we would have that next piece of content. If it's set up in a way that it like, understands the size of the viewport and loads as many as it needs for that viewport, uh, then we would index that. That that's a su super interesting um, because some sites with sort of let's say it's not infinite scroll, but what they do is they'll add a, they'll do that like the first time you scroll they'll load another twenty, but then it, they'll show a button they have to click to load, which yeah. means that wouldn't load if the viewport was bigger. So that's thanks. That was super interesting. Sure. Okay. Um, our page is crawled often by the mobile crawler. How is the importance of the desktop page if the page is crawled by the mobile crawler? Are there main differences in analyzing pages by different crawlers? What are the main factors we should worry about when creating our mobile site? Uh, so by mobile crawler, I assume you mean that your website is in the mobile-first indexing uh, setup. And what happens with mobile-first indexing is we essentially only index the version that we see with the smartphone Googlebot. We do check the desktop version from time to time, but that's mostly just to make sure that things are, are linked up properly. If you have alternate URL set up that we understand, these are linked accordingly. Um, but for indexing, we would only use a mobile version of a site. In practice, I, I think this difference is less and less visible because as people move to responsive web design setups, it is less the case that you have completely different content on desktop and mobile, but more it's just like uh, positioned slightly differently. Uh, so that's, I think, less of an issue overall with regards to the amount of content there. Uh, but uh, in kind of like with, with mobile-first indexing, if there's anything that's only on your desktop pages, then we would not see that at all for the mobile index. And we would not index that. And that would also mean that regardless of users using desktop or mobile to search on Google, we would essentially only show the version that we see with the mobile uh, Googlebot. Um, so if you're just changing the design on these pages, that's that doesn't change anything for us. If you're really reducing the amount of content on mobile, then that means we would only index that reduced amount of content. I think overall, mobile sites are more and more going in the direction that they're almost providing more functionality nowadays than, than kind of the, the old school desktop sites. And with that, the responsive design kind of keeps things together. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, at least in the beginning, it was a bit tricky that sometimes mobile sites were just slimmed down or simplified versions of a desktop site, which would make it harder for mobile-first indexing. Uh, with mobile-first indexing, in general, we've I think we, we have a significant part of the web moved over to mobile-first indexing already. Uh, we plan to shift everything over towards end of the year. Um, I think we had a date like in September. I don't know if that date will shift with all of the coronavirus stuff happening as well. Um, but that we still see sites kind of preparing for mobile-first indexing. There are not a ton of sites left over, so maybe that'll still make sense. Um, I have a website, and I lost traffic. It's a ringtones download website with 60,000 ringtones on it. On the 17th of December, we lost our ranking. And if I search my site uh, with a site colon query, I only see seven pages available. I have not received any manual action. Um, is it an algorithmic penalty in which Google removes web pages? Uh, what can I do to recover my traffic? Uh, so in general, a site query is not representative of all of the pages that we have indexed. So it's, it's a good way to get a rough view of what we have indexed, but it's not the comprehensive list. It's not meant to be like that. Uh, for more information on how or what we have indexed, I would use Search Console, the index coverage report there. Uh, that gives you a better look at the pages that are actually indexed. Uh, with regards to losing traffic, 
I, I realize that's, that's sometimes hard. What I would do in a case like this is maybe post in the Webmaster Help Forum to uh, get some input from peers who, who might have seen similar situations on other or kind of related websites. In general, I think with, with a website that's focused on ringtones, um, it'll be a little bit tricky because our algorithms really do try to look out for unique, compelling, high-quality content. And if your whole website is built up on essentially providing ringtones that are the same as everywhere else, then I don't know if our algorithms would say this is a really important website that we need to focus on and highlight more in search. Uh, so with, with that in mind, if you're focused on kind of this small amount of content that is the same as everyone else, then I would try to find ways to significantly differentiate yourselves uh, to really make it clear that what you have on your website is significantly different than all of those other millions of ringtone websites that have kind of the same content. Uh, maybe there is a way to do that with regards to the, the content that you provide. Maybe there is a way to do that with the, the functionality that you provide. Um, but you really need to make sure that what, what you have on your site is really significantly different enough that our algorithms will say, well, this is what we need to index instead of all of these others that just have a list of ringtones on the website. Uh, so that's probably not, not going to be that easy to make that kind of a shift. But that's generally the direction I would head. And that's, that's the same recommendation I would have for any kind of website that offers essentially the same thing as lots of other websites do. You really need to make sure that what you're providing is unique and compelling and high quality uh, so that our systems and users in general will say, I want to go to this particular website um, because they offer me something that is unique uh, on the web. And I don't just want to go to any random uh, other website. Um, can it help SEO by reducing web pages by marking our product pages no index, uh, which have almost zero impressions in the last 16 months? Uh, currently, our 10 to 15% pages are like this, and they're just dead weight on our site. Um, I was wondering that after no indexing such pages, we will submit fewer pages to Google in the sitemap, and Google could focus on the rest of our site better. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's something that, that I know some sites do. I think uh, it is not an, a totally unreasonable approach to say that uh, the pages that nobody cares about, I essentially remove from my website. Um, but it's something where I wouldn't just blindly do this. So if you're just blindly focusing on the number of impressions that you have for individual products and you drop them from search, then it's very easy to drop things that are actually useful, but they're just not that common. Uh, it might be that maybe it's an archive uh, version of a product or a page where people, after a certain period of time, they need to go back there to find instructions for repairing this product. Or they want to look up historical information about a specific item. And that's not something that happens every day. So if you just purely look at the number of impressions, then it's easy to accidentally include a lot of things that are actually still useful uh, for the web. They're just not that commonly used. Uh, on the other hand, looking at the number of impressions and the types of pages that you have uh, on your website, that can give you a little bit of a better understanding which types of pages are more important for users. And that can either guide you to saying, well, this type of page is something that maybe I don't want to provide anymore. Or perhaps it can guide you into saying, well, this type of page is currently not seen as being that useful. Maybe if I significantly improved it, it would be different. Uh, and that's also something where you don't just go and say, blindly look at the number of impressions, but rather you have to make a judgment call and look at that and see, does it make sense to kind of remove this? Does it make sense to improve it? And a lot of times, it does make sense to improve things on the web. 
Uh, with regards to just having fewer pages and those fewer pages then ranking higher, I don't see that happening so much. Uh, it can help for a very large website to reduce the number of pages that they provide uh, just purely from, from a technical point of view, and that if we can like crawl one-tenth of the pages on a website, then it's a lot easier for us to pick up those one-tenth of those pages uh, a lot faster. Uh, uh, and that can, in turn, help us to figure out, well, maybe these are the pages that are really important for the website. Uh, but if you're just dropping a handful of pages here and there, I don't think it changes anything for crawling and probably not much for, for the website in search overall. Ooh, we made it to the bottom. Wow, that's a change. OK, uh, let's see if there's anything new that got added. Um, Let's see. OK. Uh, hosting a sitemap file for a domain on a subdomain, is that OK? Yes, that's OK. Uh, if it's OK, what steps would I need to take? Uh, so essentially, you just need to let us know that the sitemap file is on a different host. Uh, you can point at the sitemap file in the robots.txt file. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, you can also use Search Console. If you have both of these uh, verified in Search Console, you can submit those sitemap files there, and those would also count. Uh, sorry for bugging in again with a new follow-up. Sure. Because uh, sure. I, I saw that question, so I didn't want to uh, ask mine before you came to it. So basically, uh, subdomains, sitemaps, uh, I got that covered since before. But hosting sitemap, sitemaps on on third-party domains, like a totally different domain, is supposed to be you're supposed to be able to do it. I can mm -hmm. see that it works because I can see uh, when we when we serve hreflang information through those sitemaps, I can see how the international targeting report is saying you got hreflangs and they're all looking good. But I cannot see any coverage reports uh, per sitemaps in Search Console. Is I, that supposed to be like that, or I think. I think that's the case, but it's not that that we don't use those sitemaps. It's just uh, in the UI and Search Console, they don't have it set up that you can uh, combine the coverage report with a sitemap file that's hosted somewhere else. All right. And that, any plans on kind of uh, adding that? You know, I don't know. Um, it's it's the first time I really hear about this, but it's something that that makes sense. So maybe we should. Check with the Search Console folks to see if there, there's a way to add that. I yeah, imagine I sent, from, I, I from sent a UI you that. point of view, it's probably tricky. Yeah, I sent you that domain I asked about previously. This is the same domain, so they have that set up. So okay. uh, you, if you want to sneak peek on that, you can do that as well. I sent okay. it in the chat here and also on Twitter for you. Perfect. OK. Sounds great. And the other question is with regards to the 3D AR program for Google Search. Uh, I have nearly 1,000 products ready to upload to our retailers. They could usually really use some help uh, in this. Um, I don't know what the current status is there. But if you can send me um, maybe a domain uh, where, where some of these are hosted now, uh, then I, I can pass that on to the team that's working on these kind of AR 3D integrations. I think that's really cool, cool stuff that they're doing there. But uh, I understand they're kind of uh, short on time, so I don't know how quickly they'll be able to do that. Oh, OK, cool. You posted it in the chat. Cool. OK. I could take a look at that. Cool. Um, yeah, I think we got through the questions, more or less. Is there anything else on any of your minds that uh, you'd like to talk about? I, I gave someone else a chance for a while, so I'll, I'll, I'll drop in again. Um, OK. One thing that we are uh, seeing, uh, at least we're kind of thinking that we're seeing it, is that we have a couple of domains that we monitor, and they're improving quite a lot over the last few weeks, like tremendously, uh, both in terms of that um, search for their industry has increased because of this coronavirus. But also, so that's one thing, more impressions, you get more clicks if you rank. But we also see improvements in rankings. And this is despite no changes going on at all in terms of uh, technical or content-wise, more or less. 
Um, so we're kind of sort of thinking the changes in intent with searchers is also impacting how we rank, because we match that intent better than our competitors do. I kind of understand if you can't really tell me if that's the case, but um, I, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say offhand. I don't think it's it's as simple as as just matching those two parts, uh, but I I do know that people are working on our algorithms to to improve them, uh, particularly with regards to. Uh, queries where, where they're seeing a lot more activity on with regards to kind of the coronavirus and the medical situation in general. Uh, so my general feeling would be it's not just purely based on changes in user behavior and intent, but maybe a mix of various things kind of coming together. As it almost always is, I guess. Yeah. Uh I, I think, in, in particular, in the, the current situation, it, it is the case that we have more people working on improving the search results in general. And there are probably side effects from there as well. All right. Thanks. Sure. Hey, uh, John, uh, hi. Uh, hi. I have a question regarding negative SEO. Uh, for example, we 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 have uh, basically spammers uh, that li link to us from like uh, hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands of domains. Or oh, they do it uh, slowly over time, and I I, I I regularly check and add them to the disavow file. But I I don't know if this are uh, uh, having an effect on the site because it's like. Um, um, they they spam a lot of links. Like uh, may, maybe one one domain can link you ten thousand times, and there's like hundreds and and thousands of domains. So in the end, you look at it, and you, you I think you can even have more more spam incoming links than than actual real links. So I'm worried about that. Uh, I don't know if I should be worried. <laughs> uh for for most of these things, I I think our systems get it get it right, and there's nothing you need to do there. Uh, so that from from that point of view, I I wouldn't really worry about the situation. If you're already adding them to a disavow file, then you're kind of like making sure that Google systems can't take them into account. Uh, but in general, a lot of these spammy domains they just link to everything. And we, we've seen them for the longest time. And we're pretty good at recognizing these kind of spammy domains and just ignoring them. So you'll see them in the link reports in Search Console because we, we've seen their links there. Uh, but just because they're in the link reports in Search Console doesn't mean that they have any effect on your website. Uh, so that's something where, I don't know, we, we occasionally get people to who point at things around negative SEO and say, like, Google needs to double check this, because I found this one case where it, where it did have an effect. Therefore, it might have an effect overall. Um, but pretty much all of the negative SEO cases that, that I've sent to the web spam team to manually double check, they're, they're working as intended. Where from, from our side, we're ignoring the things we should be ignoring and treating things uh, appropriately that we're not ignoring. Um, so I would say for, for most websites out there, you probably don't need to use the disavow tool at all. And if you're worried about this and you see some domains linking to you and it looks really spammy, then it's like you're welcome to use the disavow tool. And that has no negative effect. So it's not that if you're using the disavow tool, we think you're a spammer, uh, that kind of thing either. Why I started using it because it was a sheer amount of domains and, and links, and I was like, uh, better to be sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. And it's something where Google does has this magical black box where we ignore all of these spammy links. But as a site owner, you just want to be sure that everything is, is ignored that you don't want to have taken into account. And that's, that's what this is about links tool is for. OK, thank you very much. All right. More questions from any of you. Looks like there's also a bunch of back and forth in the chat, which I haven't had a chance to go through. 
Anything we should cover? I think the page speed question on um, on the extended viewport was uh, particularly interesting in that chat. Uh, OK, let me see. Um, the page speed part. So, um, so when I, I'm not quite sure, like how how that's I, I the page speed. But in, in general, when when it comes to speed and ranking, uh, it's not the same as what we use for indexing. So that's that's sometimes a, a bit confusing for for indexing and crawling. We we need to be able to access the resources as quickly as possible, and for rendering, we do the long viewport thing. Uh, but when it comes to understanding the speed of a page for ranking purposes, uh, we essentially look at the pages the way that a user would see them uh, when they access them on a device. So for ranking, we use kind of uh, theoretical lab tests where we do things like the PageSpeed Insight score and other scores. And we also use field data, which I believe is also shown in PageSpeed Insights now uh, with kind of similar to the, the Chrome user experience that are there, which is based on what people have actually seen. Uh, so from, from a ranking point of view, we would base our speed factors on the normal viewports that people have uh, when, when they view the pages, which uh, is, is slightly different on desktop and mobile. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's based on the viewport that people have. And for rendering, for indexing, we would use kind of this long extended viewport with loading the content and trying to make sure that everything is in there. So but those are that, sometimes slightly different. That kind of sparks an interesting follow-up question as well, uh, whereas um, so let's say that a website is showing all green lines in uh, page speed report in Search Console from you know, the Chrome user experience report. Mm -hmm. But in the lab test, uh, they're terrible, uh, which could be because you know, they target a market where everyone has really modern cell phones on very high internet connections. So they load quite quickly. But on the lab test, they load very poorly. Uh, would you say then it's, uh, it's still important to try to improve the lab test, even though all our users are getting a great user experience? I I think that's always something you you have to kind of like judge almost on your own. I think from purely a ranking point of view, probably that's okay. Um, it's it's also a bit tricky with a lot of these kind of lab tests in that they test so many different metrics and it's hard to know which metrics you should really focus on there. And uh, from our point of view, we try to get like the overall picture. And we try to combine multiple of these metrics to understand what, what the overall view is of a web page. So if, if the field data is looking fantastic and some lab tests are kind of slow and others are kind of OK, then I wouldn't really worry about it. All right, thanks. Cool. OK. Lots of good questions today. Um, cool. Um, let's let's take a break here. Um, it's been great having you all here. Uh, thank you all for joining in. Thanks for all of the the questions as well that were submitted and live. Uh, always good good to see. Um, I I think the next batch is lined up for next week on Tuesday and Friday again. Uh, so the usual times and dates. Uh, also, another one on in German lined up next week. Um, in the meantime, I wish you all, I don't know, good Easter if you're celebrating Easter, uh, maybe a short break. Um, I don't know if you can really go out and enjoy things, depending on where you are, uh, but hopefully things, things are well. Uh, so wishing you all a great weekend, at least. Um, looking forward to seeing you next time, then. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Jonah.